100 years ago, women and men across the United States achieved a monumental win for the women's rights movement. On August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution was ratified, extending suffrage to women. In honor of the United States Suffrage Centennial, we invite you to jump aboard the Suffrage Special Whistle Stop Tour. The Suffrage Special Train will make eight virtual whistle stops. We will visit Spokane, Pasco, Ellensburg, Vancouver, Bellingham, Seattle, Tacoma, and reach the end of the line in Olympia on August 26th. Join us as the Suffrage Special Whistle Stop Tour winds through Washington once again. On June 29th, 1909, the Washington Suffrage Special Train traveled across Washington State. After leaving Spokane in the wee hours of the morning, it ran along the tracks of the Northern Pacific Railway, stopping in Pasco before entering central Washington. Two growing cities awaited those on board that morning. North Yakima, a city of progress and elegance, boasted new hotels, businesses, warehouses, and industries just steps from the rail line. The city had been incorporated in 1886 after a disagreement between Yakima City, now Union Gap, and the Northern Pacific Railroad led to the new town being established nearly four miles away. It was a growing and bustling town with new irrigation that the suffragists found when the train arrived that June morning in 1909. It too was growing by leaps and bounds. Numerous buildings were being erected in the heart of downtown and the Washington State Normal School at the northern end of the community was seeing some of its largest classes, full of bright women and men wanting to become teachers. Ellensburg had been platted in 1875 and was incorporated in 1883. When Kittitas County separated from Yakima County, the suffragists saw a city that had come back from the ashes, literally. Ellensburg was a community that had rebuilt after losing nearly 10 downtown blocks and 200 homes on July 4, 1889. With impending statehood, the local women looked forward to equal suffrage and equal voices on that day in 1889. They celebrated with great fervor, as they would have their votes restored from what had been given in 1883 when they themselves had celebrated their own county being established only to have their voting rights stripped and restored several times in subsequent years. Education across the new state was encouraged. In Ellensburg, the Washington State Normal School opened with its first class in 1891 and the building constructed as the school was completed in 1894. Today, this building is known as Barge Hall at Central Washington University. Education had largely been seen as a part of the women's sphere, and it continued to be that way as class sizes grew, often with the number of women in attendance outnumbering men. The intent for education and equal suffrage grew hand in hand, and many at the normal school participated in the local auxiliary club endeavors. Those on board the train bound for the National Suffrage Convention in Seattle saw these bustling cities, and the communities in the heart of Washington welcomed them. North Yakima and Ellensburg had looked forward to the suffrage special train visit for weeks. Special articles ran in the local newspapers, drumming up support and attendance. When the train arrived in North Yakima in the late morning, it was met by a crowd of nearly 500 individuals. There was not an organized reception, since there was no official auxiliary club of the Washington Equal Suffrage Association in North Yakima, but individuals turned out all the same. Other local women's clubs, including the very active chapter of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, took many of the suffragists around the city on car rides. As many notable women from North Yakima were involved, the newspapers took note and stated, when women like Mrs. Ida Houston Harper, Mrs. Clarence McKay, Mrs. O.H.P. Belmont, the Duchess of Marlborough, Lillian Nordica, and Jane Addams lend their aid to a cause. It cannot possibly be considered a cause which can be laughed away. The women were shown early irrigation projects which enabled the valley to be green, like this water wheel for irrigation along Natchez Avenue. They were also treated to delicious, freshly picked cherries that many from the East Coast and countries abroad had never had before. 
While the Northern Pacific Depot was under construction nearby, suffragists spoke from the rear platform of the train, discussing the need for women's suffrage. The crowd gathered around the suffrage special train connected the most to Speaker Helen Francis Fanny Garrison Villard, daughter of abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, cheering as she spoke of her husband, Henry Villard, and his work as the president of the Northern Pacific Railway. After reaching Seattle, Mrs. Villard shared, Many tributes of respect and admiration have been paid to my noble companion in the great Northwest, which are carefully cherished by me and by my children. But I crave one more, and it is this, that Mr. Villard's keen sense of justice and love of fair play for women shall find an echo in the hearts of the men of Washington in November 1910, and that they will proclaim with loud accord that the women of Washington are no longer bound, but free, no longer disenfranchised, but regenerated, disenthralled, equal partners in the unending struggle of the human race for nobler laws and higher moral standards. The whistle stop in Ellensburg was planned for only 20 minutes, but the Ellensburg Auxiliary Club and community made the most of the time. The local band played and suffragists were showered with locally grown roses and other flowers from nearby yards, gardens, and florists. Kittitas County resident and president of the Washington Equal Suffrage Association, Emma Smith DeVoe, spoke to the crowd first. Several other women commented on the need for equal rights, including Charlotte Perkins Gilman, noted author and poet, who addressed the principles of the suffragist movement. Mrs. DeVoe introduced Patrick H. W. Ross, a very influential and well-connected Ellensburg businessman who welcomed those aboard the suffrage special on behalf of the city of Ellensburg. Ross served on the board of the Ellensburg Chamber of Commerce and had since its inception. Ross also was one of two men who operated the Bank of Ellensburg, the only existing bank in the community since the financial panic of 1893. Ross and the chamber staff used this opportunity to hand out information, including newly printed copies of The Coast magazine, which featured Kittitas County in its May 1908 issue and touted the community's growing prosperity. The Ellensburg Auxiliary Branch of the Washington Equal Suffrage Association wanted those aboard the suffrage special train to have a unique and delicious treat, in addition to seeing the great sights and meeting sizable crowds. They arranged for 25 young girls in white dresses to hand out freshly picked strawberries. Before the train departed, each suffragist and suffragette aboard was gifted a single red apple. The local delegates boarding in Ellensburg brought along a crate of apples to be shared by those who wanted more. In 1909, apples grew bountiful in Ellensburg and North Yakima, and still do to the present day, with countless varieties available year-round. Those joining the train in Ellensburg included Mrs. David Murray and Mrs. H. Alice Mundy, the presidents of the Ellensburg and Thorpe Auxiliary Clubs, respectively, along with many other club officers. Some members were heading to Seattle while others were planning to conclude their journeys in Tacoma. Women from Yakima County had joined the train earlier in the day. These women reflected the strong women who had come before, with the same ideals and principles of freedom and equality. Most women in the central Washington region recalled the attempt to win the vote in 1898, where Laura Hall Peters, the vice president and organizer of the Washington Equal Suffrage Association, had gotten an amendment up for a vote in the state legislature. That September, she visited central Washington, first reaching Ellensburg, where she spoke at local churches about the need for women to vote. Then during her visit to Yakima County, Mrs. Peters established an auxiliary club that was called the Ottenham Equal Suffrage Club, whose primary goals mirrored those in the women's suffrage field. We claim the ballot for the reason that it is right and just, and not a question of expediency. The same reasons that make it right for men to vote, such as self-government, self-protection, freedom, and liberty, are just as good for women. However, the 1898 vote to amend the state constitution to grant women the right to vote failed by a two-to-one margin as worries mounted that the equal suffrage bill would directly lead to prohibition. Several liquor businesses in the heart of Washington fought against the amendment, along with other groups, keeping women from the vote. 
This fear was driven by the fact that the Women's Christian Temperance Union also was a direct and very vocal supporter of equal suffrage. In an article to the Yakima Herald in February 1898, Mrs. Cora Green, president of the North Yakima chapter of the WCTU, stated that there was no other organization that had done as much for the equal suffrage movement as the WCTU at that time. This was true to the Central Washington region as the Washington Equal Suffrage Association chapters were not established until later that year. However, the Women's Christian Temperance Union played a key role in Central Washington where they established reading rooms, early libraries, and water fountains in the cities. Suffrage remained a key part of their focus. When women's suffrage passed in Washington in 1910 as a result of the efforts of those aboard the Suffrage Special and other groups, organizations like the Women's Christian Temperance Union in North Yakima gathered together to celebrate the success of the ballot. They, along with other prohibitionist groups, expected that soon Washington would be dry, and the only regret was that another election to try for a dry Yakima could not be held for two years. In the Ellensburg Dawn, prohibitionists noted that with the passage of women's suffrage, it would add 30 to 50 percent to the anti-saloon voting strength. In the communities of Ellensburg and North Yakima, eyes turned toward prohibition with women now allowed to cast their ballot. The small towns and rural peoples like those at the heart of Washington helped to win the vote for prohibition statewide in 1914. Saloons were mandated to close effective midnight December 31, 1915 in Washington state. It was after this, women continued the campaign for equal suffrage and prohibition to the federal levels. Local women voted regularly where they could have their voices heard and become directly involved in issues concerning them. However, many in the area still remained disenfranchised from the vote, whether by race or by residential address. Over the years, the federal and state governments had added rulings in order to fix those injustices. Even as recently as 2019, Washington State legalized all addresses, including non-traditional locations such as temporary stays, motels, and other accommodations for all individuals to be eligible to vote in our state. Let's turn things over now to the leaders of the Washington Equal Suffrage Association, Emma Smith DeVoe and May Arkwright Hutton. Both women were aboard the 1909 suffrage special train heading to Seattle. Little did they know that in a few short days, the tension that had been brewing between them would be thrown into the public spotlight during the Washington Equal Suffrage Association convention. Emma Smith DeVoe was one of the two leaders of the campaign that won the vote for women in Washington in 1910. As the president of the Washington Equal Suffrage Association, Emma was at the center of that campaign. And during most of it, she lived in Thorpe, near Ellensburg. When the suffrage special train stopped in Ellensburg on its way to Seattle in 1909, Emma spoke from the rear platform. As a child, Emma had attended a lecture by suffrage pioneer Susan B. Anthony. When Miss Anthony asked those who were in favor of equal rights to stand, Emma stood up and discovered that she was the only one standing in the room except Miss Anthony. She was very embarrassed, but she didn't sit down. She decided, I shall stand for equal rights all my life. And she did. When she grew up, she became a professional suffrage organizer. And she learned from the best. She worked in several states directly with Susan B. Anthony. By the time that she and her husband, Henry, moved to Tacoma in 1905, Emma had worked in many suffrage campaigns, including in Idaho, where women won the vote in 1896. Emma Smith DeBeau became the president of the Washington Equal Suffrage Association in the fall of 1906. She began to lay the groundwork for the campaign that would lead to the vote in 1910. In a letter to Anna Howard Shaw, the president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, Emma outlines the work ahead of her. 
I am encouraged at what I see in Washington, even though it is going to be a very large job. It really amounts to organizing two states. The western portion of the state is more populated and cosmopolitan, while the east is primarily a farming region where spring comes early. If I'm to start suffrage groups there this year, I must do so right after the holidays. Since we must go the route of getting an amendment to the state constitution, the big job is, of course, to convince the legislators to draft such an amendment and to place it on the ballot at the next general election. I believe we can see this route to victory in the time we have remaining before November 1910 if we move wisely. I should think the pioneer men of the West are really no different from men anywhere in that if we show them that we are ready intellectually and emotionally to accept their gift of suffrage, they cannot but choose to grant it. We must train the women how to show the men what we want them to see, and I believe we can. My thanks to you for your support and the National's assistance to me. Onward, Emma Smith DeVoe. In the spring of 1908, Henry and Emma moved to Thorpe when his railroad job took him there. They lived in Thorpe during the rest of the suffrage campaign and into 1911. One key element in Emma's plan for winning the vote was that suffrage needed to be kept completely separate from the prohibition issue. She warned. The Women's Christian Temperance Union, while we share many of its beliefs, must not be allowed to appear to be an organization interchangeable with our own. It is imperative that the WCTU's leaders be convinced to go about their franchise work quietly so as not to arouse the liquor industry and its customers. The suffrage movement could not survive an organized attack from these interests and must not place itself in this kind of peril. Emma favored a style of campaigning called the still hunt method, which she described as working quietly to influence key men and women, that is, persons prominent in the state's economic and intellectual endeavors. She firmly believed, the more womanly we can be, the better for our cause. It was imperative to approach men in a ladylike manner. May Arkwright Hutton set out in her early 20s from Ohio, leaving her family behind to head to Idaho and to make her own way. And that was May's way. She was a self-made millionaire. She and her husband invested in a silver mine in Idaho and then used their millions to help orphans throughout the state and working very hard to get the vote for women. She believed so strongly in votes for women that after achieving that goal in Idaho, she gave up her right to vote to move to Washington where they did not yet have the vote for women and did her work there to ensure that all women would have the right to vote. May did not come from money or education. She was crass. She loved red and she loved to be noticed wearing it. She loved riding around in her big red automobile. She liked red so much that she even became famous for baking cherry pies. While May was vice president to President Emma Smith DeVoe in the Washington Equal Suffrage Association, she had a very different approach. It's amazing that these two women worked together for as long as they did. July 1, 1909, Seattle, Washington, Mr. A.J. Blevin, editor, The Seattle Times, Dear Sir, I wish to thank you again for the many favors you have shown us in the past, but I find that I must beg at another at this time, and one of an exceptional nature. Spokane, July 5th, 1909, Mr. William H. Cowles, editor, The Spokane Spokesman Review. Dear Will, I read with a little amusement your article on last week's suffrage convention in Seattle. The Times printed account of the proceedings of the Washington Equal Suffrage Association convention yesterday was in many ways unfortunate, and I must ask that it be amended. 
especially like the quote about the hall looking like the Roman Colosseum. I think, and I was one of the group that got thrown to the lions, that you'd better extend your metaphor even further to tell about how the delegates from your own city and environs here were pit against the rest of the women like gladiators, fighting each other to entertain the emperor. I refer in particular to events described in response to the Credentials Committee report given on the convention floor. And I quote, some of the delegates called others thieves, liars, and scoundrels. And there was hysterical weeping and screaming. A squad of bluecoats dispatched to the hall to quell a riot found the convention in tears. Emperor Emma and her hand-picked so-called nobility who told us we couldn't be seated. So while she fiddled around and banged her little gavel so she could reject us all orderly-like, I told her what she needed to hear and walked out. While it is true that some tempers became shorter than I could have wished during yesterday's debate, I feel that the above account has been sensationalized, and I most respectfully insist that you report or print a retraction. Held my own convention elsewhere in the neighborhood, some place where there weren't any slaves and masters, only free and equal people voting for what they believed in. We are now called the Washington Political Equality League. We will get the vote for women in 1910, and the only empire we recognize is the Inland Empire. Regards, May Arkwright Hutton. It is tempting, I realize, to amplify news of this nature. But I'm sure you will agree that the picture thus painted will be most detrimental to the cause of votes for women. This is particularly true in that the National Suffrage Convention, due to sit tomorrow in our fair city, must be seen by the currently voting public as a gathering of mature and enlightened minds. I cannot overemphasize the urgency of this matter. Very truly yours, Emma Smith DeVoe, WESA President. Emma Smith DeVoe and May Arkwright Hutton seldom saw eye to eye, but together they were very effective. I think they're a good reminder that you don't have to agree in order to work toward a common goal. There is strength in diversity. As with many things, life comes full circle. Those who were important to the suffrage movement here in Washington State in 1910 eventually passed away becoming part of the fabric of our collective history. In this reflection and centennial anniversary celebration, it is also important to remember those where they have been laid to rest. And this is a project that you, yes you, can take part in. And even right there in your own community, wherever you may be. The Washington State Historical Society has been building a virtual cemetery to honor and connect these important people in our state's suffrage history. Inspired by the National Women's History Alliance, Here Lies a Suffragist program. You can find it by searching Here Lies a Suffragist Washington State on findagrave.com and there you can find out more about the suffragists, both men and women in your nearby cemeteries and wherever else they may be resting, if known. Like here in Yakima is Florence Blomquist Kent, a dedicated suffragist who rests in the Terrace Heights Memorial Park. This project also needs your support. We want to make sure that we include every suffragist from every corner of our state and that the information is accurate and complete. Are you interested in getting involved? Great! Just contact Elisa Law, the Women's Suffrage Centennial Coordinator, to find out how you can support this effort in honor a suffragist near you.
Next up on the suffrage special is Vancouver, where local changemakers comment on the importance of voting today. All aboard! <laughs> 